you know, had to give a nine-year-old this season an unsportsmanlike penalty uh, for screaming at me. And I was like, I've never had a nine-year-old scream at me um, over a blatantly obvious trip, at least to me it was. Um, his, his coach agreed too, and I don't know what, what happened there, but, you know, it just, it happens. And, you know, look, look, look at that kid and you're like, hey, you, you know, calm down. Let's go to the box. We'll figure this out. You got two minutes, well, minute and a half, and then we'll come back out. We'll play better. Kid came back out, scored a goal on his next shift. How's it going, Aaron? Uh, good to talk to you. Can you give uh, everybody a brief introduction of who you are and your kind of hockey story? Yeah, so uh, Aaron Gary. I grew up mainly around the Kansas City area. Recently moved over to the St. Louis side where there's a little bit more hockey, just a, just a little bit. Um, I grew up in Kansas City around the time and where I was at, there wasn't much hockey to be played. Um, majority of my time was spent playing roller outside with a bunch of kids in the neighborhood. Um, always grew to have that fascinate, fascination with hockey, but never really got the experience to play uh, competitively, especially not professionally. Um, eventually led myself into a career of officiating where I've officiated uh, somewhere upwards of seven different sports, including basketball, uh, baseball, soccer, um, a little bit of wrestling, and they'll now move myself into hockey and possibly even lacrosse. Maybe thought about that a little bit. Um, okay. But in the past few years of a, uh, officiating hockey i've been able to traverse multiple different locations as far south as dallas all the way up to minneapolis and fargo north dakota um recently uh ended up getting a job in the usa hockey odp program which offers us refs the ability to work in the juniors leagues here in the united states um, a lot of those junior leagues do associate with the american professional hockey scene so a lot of our refs interchange between the echl ahl and of course those interchange with the nhl um, so we're all in that little pipeline. There's not a many, not very many of us. I like to always shout out that, you know, every team has 20 skaters and maybe a few left on the roster, but there's about 40 or 50 refs in each one of those professional leagues and about 200 of us that work all of the junior leagues. That is impressive. That's cool. Can you kind of talk about what it takes, uh, or at least how you got started into refing and kind of the milestones and the stepping stones you've kind of taken so far? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the first thing that it's obviously going to have is you're going to want to have that that want and drive and just the love of the sport. Um, if you love watching hockey, it's the best way to make extra cash. If you love playing hockey, it's the best way to make money so you can play hockey, right? Um, there's plenty of kids that I know that are in college traveling from out of state. A kid here in St. Louis is uh, from Florida going to Maryville, uh, does refereeing men's league and hockey games on the weekends, gets him the cash he needs to provide for his hockey, you know, just living, food and everything like that. But that pure love of the sport is what you need. You got to enjoy watching. If you don't enjoy it, you're not going to have fun. Um, ultimately, you got to be a really good skater. Uh, the skating style is completely different than playing. Um, we don't get any line changes. You don't get to sit on the bench, maybe 15 minutes in between games for youth games, maybe 10 minutes after the players get off the ice for professional level games where you get those period breaks, and then you're back on the ice first before everybody else is. So having that conditioning, having that ability and having strong skating ability is very important. Um, we do always have to be able to get out of the way and whatever level you're working at, it gets a little bit harder as you go up. Um, skating is more difficult. Plays get a little bit more intricate and uh, you might find yourself in the way and sometimes take a hit, but uh, being resilient and durable is part of that as well. Um, I think, I think that's something most people don't think about is you have to do multiple games back to back. You don't get a line change. You're out there no. the entire time. No. Yeah. And that's, uh, it's hard, uh, especially um, in systems like two man for youth games and sometimes high school games and three man for a majority of those lower level professional and junior college games. Um, it gets very difficult, especially for that single rep who gets to have the fun of skating the entire sheet of the ice for 60 minutes, God forbid, overtime. Um, so yeah, it's it's a strenuous task, and uh, definitely takes conditioning. Have you ever seen any refs throw up, or uh, or like not be able to hack it? Oh, if, no, that, that is, it, it might happen, but uh, you're getting chirped and you're buying the crew drinks afterwards. So um, that's so fu that's so funny. Yeah, yeah, and if it, it, you hold it until you get to the locker room, you can't let them see the weakness, you know. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned buying drinks. I think that's uh, one of those unsung rules that a lot of players don't know about. So I'm going to I'm going to drop a bomb for any hockey players listening. If you're on the ice and a referee falls down, that means his like knee touches the ice or hand touches the ice. He's got to buy beer for at least his guys. 
Yep. But if you chirp him when he falls down too, I'm pretty sure he's got to buy you a beer too. I don't know if I just made that up or if that's something I heard, but I knew that if you if you went down and you know everybody that started chirping you got a free soda out of the gig. So I'm usually one of the first ones to say something when I see a ref go down. Oh yeah, yeah. Especially if I like you, I might invite you to the drinks afterwards. But if not, if you don't like me, I'm not going to pay you. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, those it gets more expensive as you go up in leagues too. Because um, from my understanding, from the guys that I've talked to in the NHL, it's not drinks; it's uh, it's the full meal, and they don't go to they don't go to McDonald's. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. So, what do you what do you think like the current state of refing is? Do you have any comments of like currently what uh, you know? What are the conditions for refs? What are some things you're seeing? Is it easy to be a ref? Is it hard to be a ref? Can you kind of like Give me a state of the union for referees. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Anytime throughout all of existence, I don't think it's ever been easy to be a referee in any sport. Um, it's definitely gotten harder over the past few years, and I think there's multiple reasons for that. Um, a lot of people might push towards culture, um, just like how people are raising their children, but I don't think that really changes too much of how we see it on the ice. The biggest thing that I think that changes everything is just the money. The money that's going into the kids, going into the organizations, going into the leagues, tournaments, travel, um, it puts it on more of a higher pedestal. And the problem with that is that there's not too many refs in most places. And a lot of refs, especially this time of the season, get burnt out. Um, I'm upwards almost of 300 games this season myself. Um, and I know a lot of guys here in St. Louis um, and other places that are, you know, cooking me a little bit, too. So, you're doing so many games, every game to these kids, to these parents, um, to the scouts or everything that they, it matters, right? They, there's money here. Coaches, especially in certain leagues, are getting paid their jobs, lifelines. Um, and they want something that's called good. And so that makes the emotions and everything go up. And if everything's not, if every, all the emotions are growing up, if you got a tired ref uh, working so many games because we don't have enough of us, it there's just room for error right there. Um Having that conditioning, a lot of things that we look forward to for refs is like, be smart. If you know you're going to be out there for two or three hours or if you have a good set of games, bring food. You know, you're, you need something to recharge because the last thing you want is a tired ref who can't see straight because, you know, you're on, you know, period 17 of the day or something and you miss something. You miss the biggest call of your life maybe, right? Or at least that's what the coach tells you is the <laughs> most easiest call you could have seen. And we're human. You know, sometimes you miss things. That turns into a kerfuffle. Coach starts screaming at you. Kids follow suit. Somebody gets an unsportsman like levels, 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 levels. Somebody gets thrown out. We have game reports. Sometimes there's things, incidents that happen. And just controlling those emotions are hard, especially when you're just so tired. And uh, controlling that fatigue, I think, is the biggest part that referees have an issue with. Because um, not every official is conditioning themselves correctly. There's a lot of youth hockey officials. This is, you know, this is, they love the sport. That's why they're there. But it is a side job. It's not their main source of money. And they're not taking it the same serious level that some people that are taking it when they're working uh, NCAA D1 professional hockey, where that's their job, that's their goal. And they're going to make that mistake. The emotions are already high based on that, just like the funding that's going into it. And so now everybody cares about every game. There's no, there's no, hey, this is just a rec game. Let's just have fun. That's kind of been lost. I think that's the biggest thing that's been lost, especially across youth sports of all sports is that everybody forgets that this is just a game for the kids. And it's more important about their development to have fun, learn teamwork, camaraderie, and those important life lessons we have from playing sports as children, right? And not every single one of these kids is going to go somewhere in this sport, no matter what sport it is. If they're six or seven, eight or nine, they might not even continue with this sport to high school. They might switch sports. So just kind of bringing back that this is not necessarily a business. Yes, you know, we make money here, but we're here to have fun bring those emotions down, understand, especially in the youth levels where we're getting most of these incidents is that it's here to have fun. We're here to develop the kids and yeah, we put money into it, but that's not what it's about. It's not about the money. It's not about the kid getting a D1 scholarship at 12. You know, it's, it's about to develop that player, give them a right environment and um, promote having fun. Yeah. That's fascinating. Uh, there's two things that kind of stand out to me in that one is you talk briefly about like next thing, you know, it's like, after action reports and incident reports and things like that are getting filed i think that especially in maybe men's league uh or these some of these tournaments maybe where guys are 
hopping in and playing in the USA hockey tournament, they might not realize like when they're getting kicked out or they're getting a major penalty or they're fighting somebody or slashing somebody on the top of the head with their stick. It doesn't just like restart always, you know, like refs, if they kick a guy out, might have paperwork to fill out or, you know, especially at the youth level, like tracking of major penalties and egregious incidents. Uh, you know, I don't think people, maybe even coaches probably don't even know that there's that back end until maybe they get their first like citation or have to sign some paperwork. Um, the second thing that stood out to me that you were talking about is I, I'm 34 years old. I can remember uh, growing up playing even just like intramural house sports refs were almost like a coach out there. Like they'd pull you aside and say, Hey, here's why this wasn't a penalty or like, here's what was going on here. Here was why this was a penalty. They were much more like coach of coach coaches. They were doing coaching things where now it's like almost like the third team that's on the ice. Like, your battle you guys as referees are getting it from both ways the coach might feel like he's playing the other team and the ref um that's something that's changed is it used to be like a coaching role i feel like or a mentor role and now it's this administrative police state uh oh, yeah ad adversarial kind of who knows the game better the player the the ref and so much of that comes from like parents like on top <laughs> yeah i mean on that, top of you guys yeah and uh, the biggest thing this has been the biggest change in all sports especially in our sport has been safe sport um that's not saying that it's bad it's definitely important and we definitely need it because there's instances instances in our sport that require that oversight um but it's kind of put a damper on some of those like interactions that you would have with the young players because you're, you're being more careful. You know, you, you don't want to come off. Nobody wants to come off as that person. who's like, Oh, I enjoy talking to nine-year-olds. You know, it's kind of, it's a weird thing to say. Um, and when you're not specifically their coach and you're out to doing a job, you don't want parents looking at you weird. You don't want, you don't want to get that report. Right. Just because you're trying to be a good guy. And it's, it's hard to, to balance that. And um, that, and then, you know, you get some of the coaches that uh, instantaneously, almost immediately will not necessarily attack you, but they go for these, direct conversations with you that have no meaning sometimes, but just trying to gauge whether or not you have the balls to be on the ice. Right. And it's like, I don't need you to measure my ability to be here. You're here to coach the kids. I want to give you guys a game. Um, and then, yeah, you know, with parents and with uh, coaching, you kind of can see it trickle down to the kids. I, you know, had to give a nine-year-old this season an unsportsmanlike penalty uh, for screaming at me. And I was like, I've never had a nine-year-old scream at me. Um, over a blatantly obvious trip, at least to me it was. Um, his, his coach agreed to, and I don't know what what happened there, but you know it just it happens. And you know, look 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 at that kid, and you're like, hey, you, you know, calm down. Let's go to the box. We'll figure this out. You got two minutes, well, minute and a half, and then we'll come back out. We'll play better. Kid came back out, scored a goal on his next shift. I don't know what he list, what he thought about in the box, but it must have worked. Um, yeah, it's, I guess that communication has been lost, especially with those refs uh, at the younger levels. And I, and I can see now that you mentioned it, why you know, I was always friendly with the refs and I still kind of am like it more as a courtesy thing. But when I'm chumming it up, sometimes it comes off if other players or other, you know, spectators are seeing it. It's like, oh, he's sucking up to the refs or chumming it up or, you know, or God forbid I make a really good play. I had one recently. And a ref, like, you know, when you go back to drop the puck, it was like, oh, yeah, like kind of made a face like, whoa, that was a good goal. Everybody was reacting. And I'm like, while it's appreciated, I'm like, oh, God, who saw that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, because uh, it comes off biased, but I know it's not because at the end of the day, like, if I trip somebody or high stick somebody or do something, it's still a penalty. Like, they're not going to not call it because whatever. Yo, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't want to come off biased. <laughs> Switching gears uh, just slightly, I know that you're involved in Lavecchia's Give More, Be More, and you've kind of gone through like a physical transformation. You've put some importance on your own health. Can you talk about that kind of journey for you? Yeah. So I started working with Jeff about two years ago now, and uh, kind of, you've, I don't know if you've ever met him in person, but this guy, he is an infectious personality. You meet him, you talk to him. Next thing you know, you're going out and you're trying to achieve everything you thought you could ever do. Um, he just has that ability to inspire and motivate people that I've never really met with anybody else. And that kind of pushed me to make sure I hit those goals. Um, 
I started out working out with him. Uh, I was around like 230 pounds on my frame. Didn't look good. Um, one of the things I think about when I dropped about dropped down to 200 pounds the first time after working out with him for about four months was holy holy cow! I skate like I'm uh, like Connor McDavid. I lost 30 pounds on my back. You know, makes it a lot easier to move around. And then over those past these past uh, later months, it's been fine tuning, um, making sure that the muscles that I have are applicable to the job that I'm doing and functional. So not over here in the gym trying to lift, you know, 500 pounds off my squat and deadlift or anything like that. I want to make sure that my body's sustainable, firm, um, functional for the aspects that I'm working through and durable. And that's one of the best parts of his program is that you want to give more to your body. Um, Cause when we work out through life, uh, we're not all power lifters. We're not going to go out and, you know, lift up a car tomorrow but you will might have to chase your kid across the street. Can you balance enough? Can you run fast enough? Does your body have the coordination to do that? Can you jump over an obstacle to save your life? Functionally, we move our bodies through multiple different aspects and fields through the day that, that aren't lifting crazy amounts, but do you feel comfortable standing on one leg if you had to balance over a bar? Maybe you had to go pick up something that was off or you trip, you fall on ice. Can you pick yourself back up again kind of thing? Uh, that functionality is something that we lose when we don't train like an athlete because baseline, all, all humans are athletes. We all use our feet. We all walk. We all stand up. We all grab things. Um, those small fine tuning muscles that have to connect to your brain and connect to every other muscle, they're just as important as your biceps. Yeah. And the whole idea, so, so many of the buzzwords you're saying, you're so smart. So many of the, the buzzwords you're saying are so deep in themselves, like functional, um, I, the first thing that comes to mind when you start talking about this is that famous study that relates uh, longevity, a, a human's longevity, with their ability to get off the toilet. I don't know if you've ever seen that. No, but, but it makes, I, can, I can get it. I can get it. It makes complete sense. Like the second you don't have the strength to pick yourself up off the toilet, you require somebody to live with you and to have assistance. And that means either moving into a nursing home or like drastically changing your life and having a nurse come live with you. And so they did this big study and one of the determining factors uh, outside of like looking at specific muscles, like hamstring and quad strength and longevity and like certain muscle groups, they can say, Hey, if you have more muscle density, you're going to live longer, but they equated it down to like these certain movements. Like if you can catch yourself falling uh, it's like eight, eight years after you stop catching yourself from falling, the average person it has some sort of life event and they pass away. But it was like three years for getting, like the second you're not able to, to have the muscles in your arms, your shoulders, in your neck, in your core strength, to pick yourself up off the toilet. And that was like the closest thing that they could find to like all cause mortality that they could drill down to tell at the average person like, hey, you need the functional fitness to be able to catch yourself when falling or like catch your, your own body weight. And you need to be able to have the arm strength and the neck strength to get off the toilet and like functional medicine, how many people train those muscles and train that way and mm -hmm. aren't just doing deadlifts, but maybe looking at, you know, their erector muscles and other fine muscles to how they get up and walk around. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I know the biggest thing uh, Jeff preaches a lot, especially to people who are athletes and are, have goals that are outside of the gym, which most people do. We don't, not everybody goes to the gym to be a professional weightlifter. You have things you want to do outside in life. Um, what's the risk to reward ratio of what you're doing in the gym? The risk of hurting yourself and, you know, causing injury from doing a, a, a back squat is far greater than doing a lunge squat with a dumbbell. So why yeah. would you, you know, try to do this famous nice lift? If you're not being a professional body lift, there's not no reason to, to do those lifts. You're going to have higher risk of injuring yourself than you are to actually improving your body. So, you know, bring it down, cut down the basics, come down a little bit more, elevate the weight in a safer way that provides more functionality to your body with less risk. Because I'm not trying to, you know, I don't want to get a season ending injury, not even on the ice. A hundred percent. And I, a lot, a lot of people, because of Instagram culture now may, I guess, Instagram culture, like the amount of weight they put on the bar and the type of exercise that they're doing aren't actual functional to maybe their lifestyle. 
Um, I don't do deadlifts or back squats for that reason is, uh, like as a fringe athlete, I've always been obsessed with bodybuilders and you see guys like Ronnie Coleman and, uh, Jay Cutler and all these guys that like back squat 900 pounds for 30 years. And they have these awesome physiques, but the limiting factor on them is like, they have no discs left <laughs> because of the compression and the force. And it's like, well, it would maybe be worth it if you were training that way to be like a running back, but they were training that way to stand there like exactly. this. Exactly. <laughs> Limited movement, right? Where's that flexibility? You know, how are you going to as a hockey player reach across and do that pull across to make that move if you can't even reach your toes, you know? Yeah. Or like a, as a referee, like those did the exact same thing, like the Romanian deadlifts or like just standing up and being able to like erect your own spine yeah. while skating because you don't have a you don't have a hockey stick to hold on to uh, no. as a referee your style of skating is a, a little bit different and i think more challenging um like when i go to stick and puck or if i'm out skating i always wear all of my pads and i use a hockey stick and there's guys out there like do you really have to wear all that or do you have to use a hockey stick i'm like you're kind of you skate a specific way and in order to not fall on my knees or my shoulders or prevent an injury, I'm like leaning on my stick. Well, that makes me closer to the ice and more likely to fall. But when you're free skating or a referee, you're 100% high centered over the balance you could tip over. And it really comes down to your, your core strength way more than it does as a hockey player being able to balance a stick. Yeah, yeah, you definitely, uh, you can see that with four-year-olds and starting out to skate, put the pads on them. Next thing you know, they think they're impervious and they, they skate like a bat out of hell, but take the pads off. You got a little fragile uh, duckling on there, just making sure they don't fall down, right? Um, you know, it kind of leads towards like having that powerful core. One of my favorite workouts to do um, is farmer's carries. Um, oh, yeah. It's the most functional workout I think I, I can ever do. You're training your core grip strength, balance, and everything at once. And what's the functional application? Have you ever carried 10 bags of groceries into the house at the same time? Hey, now you can make it 35. Who knows? Um, yeah, that core strength is important. Um, we don't get to have what I like to call uh, player happy feet, uh, where you can take that, you know, you're going across a neutral zone, you'll take 15 strides. Well, you have the ability to go sit down after those 15 strides. I don't. I want to make that neutral zone one stride. I want to get the most out of my edges. I want to get the most power out of each push so I can minimize the strain I'm putting on my body so I can last longer in the game and still have my head on. Yeah, that's so smart. All right. I'm going to, we're, we're at 27 minutes. I don't want to take too much more of your time here. Oh, you're good. You're so good. I've, I've got some like some hot topic things. Maybe we can just briefly touch on or have a couple opinions on. Um, the first one is, and I just kind of thought of this, I didn't uh, uh, preempt this or send this before, but do you think they'll ever have automated hockey referees or like machine hockey referees? Is that something that's coming up in the future? Do you think? No way. There's no way. Um, hockey is one of those sports uh, where we don't have set stoppages of play where people run the plays. You have the face-offs, but it's never going to go exactly perfect. And unless you can train a computer to understand the movements of hockey and every instance of the situation that's happening at 15 to 20 miles per hour, there, there's no way a computer would be able to see each angle on the ice without having something bulky out there and be able to see it every aspect um as a you know a person who loves hockey i've watched so much hockey being a referee and an avid fan you start to understand how the body moves on ice and not only that you have to judge the game too what's happening in the game what are we seeing in the game is it a sticky game is it a chippy game are they hitting harder or is it late hits a little late are we getting a little high and you have to adjust those penalties to the game whereas a hit that might be you know, borderline in one game is definitely coming in this game because it's out of the blue. This didn't happen before. This is a different standard for this game. You you have to move it along or else we wouldn't have games. If you were to call every hockey game exactly the same, it, it no game would be complete. You, you wouldn't see any kind of competitive level because each different pairing is going to give you a different outcome. So, so hear me out. What if on this robot referee, you have a knob? And you can turn 
up the level of chippiness or down or to be like, I'm going to turn up the playoff feel from one to six on this one. And I'm going to turn the stickiness knob up, uh, what, you know, and be able to control how the game is called with knobs instead of a person. So I get uh, you. I don't, I don't think so either. It's, what it's about, hard, man. yeah. Do you, do you, what about getting refs off the ice and putting them in a booth with more cameras and more access and have them give them the ability to like stop the game remotely with a whistle or a buzzer and use like have it more of like a control center job looking at all the camera angles sitting sitting down you know you just said that maybe the toughest part of being a referee is the conditioning and the skating if what if you remove that from a referee and you put them in a suite with 16 camera angles and live tracking and you could see the the time on ice for each player and their penalty minutes or maybe their heart rate and you could have way more analytical information about the players and you could make calls remotely do you think that that's something that could work uh i want to keep my job you know. <laughs> um, taking refs the, jobs yeah one of the things that i would say would be the hardest is um we we, we try to manage the game and one thing that's specific to our game that we all love is that there's the possibility of fights. We always got to have somebody down there in the fray to be able to protect the players from dangerous situations like that. And I think removing that person, and if we had that computer system, it just lengthens that reaction time that we're going to have to protect those players. Um, the other thing but... is the, the game looks completely, camera angles are completely different. Uh, even if I put a GoPro on my head, you're not seeing what I see. It's, the, yeah. the, the coach doesn't have the same view as the referee who's down, who doesn't have the same view as the other coach the above camera angles. It, there's so many different angles because we play on a 3d field of, of ice. Basically you're not, there's no way you can catch everything with a camera. I think you just like job security. I just That's stole good. your job with a robot and I'm just messing with you. That's a good transition though. Cause uh, uh, so this last week I, I saw a game and I don't know how often this has been happening, but in the ECHL, they've gone to a four-man system. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, do you have any thoughts about like a four-man system in hockey? Uh, I like the four-man system because it means I have less work to do. Um, and by less work, I mean I don't have to skate the entire ice as the referee. The mm -hmm. hardest part as referees is confidence. You don't want to be a part of the game until you have to be a part of the game. And sometimes making that call is the hardest thing you can do because you know it's you know, you're on the spotlight. We don't want to be in the spotlight. That's the one time we're in the spotlight, but we don't want to be there. When you have the four man system, and the faster you get to the four man system, the harder it is to develop a competent referee. Uh, from what I've my experiences and you know conversing with Bill that I know, the three man system is the best way to make a competent referee. When you have a second set of eyes, for instance, in the four man system, you have two referees. Innately, as human beings, sometimes we get into that pattern where we're like, you know, I saw that, but, you know, my partner will call it. 30 seconds later, nobody raises their hands. Oh, shit. It's too late now to call it. Screw it. In the three-man system, you are the only set of eyes. You have to build that confidence. You have to make that call. If you see it, you call it, right? So mm -hmm. now, after you elevate, after you promote it, you go to that four-man system. Now you have that confidence of being the only ref. That you're gonna make that call, even if you even if you think your partner's closer, you saw it, you got that angle, you call it, come over to your partner, we talk about it. Hey, did you see that? Oh no, man, I was screened. There's a guy right in front of me. I know I was closer, but did you have it? Yeah, I saw it. I had a better angle. I'll call it. We got this. Boom, we're good. But having that confidence is key. And you know, we're we're learning too. We have a development that we have to go through. And I think three man is one of the best ways to develop that referee, not only skating ability, because you really have to be proficient to be able to skate to that level. But the confidence of, I see that, that's my job. I got that call. Don't rely on somebody else to make the call for you. Yeah, I can I can totally see that. I didn't think about that. I think that's called the bystander effect. Yep. In psychology, like um, if, for instance, if you are getting, if you're in trouble, you don't holler, somebody call the cops or somebody call an ambulance. You specifically point to somebody and say, you. Call call nine one one because otherwise, if you're just hollering at everybody, it's like, oh, this is a huge disturbance. Of course, somebody heard this is going to call for yeah. them, and they just keep walking. 
I like the I like the four man system, but my thing is I think it should be an extra linesman and not a ref because I agree with you. I think that in ECHL, AHL, NHL hockey, the threat of two fights taking like getting out of hand and you know, having to have an extra hand while still allowing the bands to stay back and like watch the whole thing and not have to like physically get hands on somebody or you know uh i don't i don't necessarily like a ref in each zone because i think you're right it the confidence thing like even for a player i'm like okay maybe two periods get called different or a period gets called different because you're in his zone and or vice versa um or you see something not get called in your zone and you're like yelling at the other ref at the far end like dude <laughs> yeah if he's yeah, not we, gonna if he's not gonna call it like call it for him like you saw it too you know yeah we do try to, you know you don't want to step on your partner's toes because we're our team out there and we do have those conversations in the locker room especially on those higher level games in between periods because once we set the standard we want to maintain that standard on both sides both guys right all four guys even um when it comes to the fights though um technically you know that third or second ref could step in, but it's more important for those guys to take that step back and watch what's happening. hundred um, percent agree. If we added an extra linesman, I feel like the lines might get a little bit too clogged up because I get hit all the time as a linesman. Why? Because yep. where do you want to enter the zone at? Do you want to enter right in the middle of the ice or does everybody go to the corner? Where do I have right. to stand in the corner? Um, so clogging up the ice with another linesman might be a little difficult. Um, one thing that I was told recently uh, cause at the level of juniors, every single game has to be recorded for the league. Um, using that wonderful hockey TV, if you've never heard of it, it's an amazing yeah. app, but, yep. um, uh, there was one situation where we did have a fight and the team's videographer turned the camera away from the fight. Um, I, I was like, what, well, you know, the team's going to get fined they're, they're, They have to record those situations for the disciplinary committee. So I asked a player that I knew wasn't on that team, but just a player from a different organization. And I was like, Hey, do you know why they would do that? And it's like, well, you know, sometimes our coach might tell the videographer to look away from the fight because the referees on the ice, we tend to be a little bit nicer with the situation when we give the, the assessment than the disciplinary committee looking at the video. Mm-hmm. They look at that video. They'll be like, okay, no, we see exactly what happened. You know, this guy's done for so on, but as a referee, I want the game to continue. I want this game to go moving pucks. My best friend, I'm a hockey player myself. I'm here. I'm in the moment. Usually, sometimes people think of us as a little bit more lenient on what we're going to give you than what the league will give you as a disciplinary action. Yeah, and especially if you hear something before, I know that it's it's not uncommon at those levels for something to carry over for a few games, and a guy's going to warn a guy, and you're going to hear it. Oh, yeah. Like, like hey, I'm going to knock your effing teeth out or something, or just wait, just wait, just wait, and you're like – what's going on between these two guys. And sure enough, like the last whistle in a game that gets chippy, that's when that happens. And if you're not a, you know, if you're disconnected through a video watching it, you didn't know like, okay, these guys were actually going to go at it before here. It's just unfortunate that this is the time that it shows. And one of them might've hopped off the bench to do it or something, you know, like, exactly, you know. yeah. And whereas like, again, your judgment at the time of being like, okay, I know who to take. I know how to calm this down. I take these four players and I threaten this team's coach or verbally warn him. Then this thing calms down. We can play the rest of the game. I'd never heard of that though. That's interesting. I thought you were going to say it was because they knew that their guy with the bands on was like nearsighted or something. They could get away with fights in the background or something. No. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to chat with me. Is there anything before we get out of here you want to say or have any projects or anybody you want to shout out or anything? Um, I guess the only thing is if you want to be a ref, try it out. You know, it's a great way to make cash. Um, we always need more people. And if you are, if you get into it and you love it, you enjoy it, you want to go somewhere with it. If you, if you care about the game, you can make it pretty far. You could do some pretty cool things. Um, not to say that there's not a lot of us, but there's just few that there's opportunities for everybody. Love it. Well, Aaron, it was a pleasure chatting with you, dude. If uh, you get a chance here in a couple months after uh, some more reffing experience, maybe you can come back and you can share some 
adult refing hockey horror stories or you can give us an update about how the uh refing development program is going for you oh yeah definitely we'll say we are uh, knocking on wood the uh, only country in the world that has a referee development program so if you look at our refs just say canada has it worse just just letting you know <laughs> i love it that's a good way to end